Hello again, friends. Welcome to our study again. Hope you've been enjoying our, uh, when I say enjoying, I guess I should qualify that. The messages we've looked at so far in the book of Revelation, most of them have been enjoyable, have they? We've been kind of picking flaws and faults with these churches that uh, John had these messages for from the Lord Jesus. And uh, there's seven churches we're looking at. We're looking at the sixth church today. And this is the second of two that have a positive uh, report. I would say, I go so far as to say that Church Today, Church of Philadelphia, uh, we know that as the city of brotherly love, right? Philadelphia, United States. Um, but it, Jesus is almost gushing over this church. Uh, he's so pleased with the report. He's really pleased with what they're doing, how they're living out their faith in a very difficult situation. We'll get into that when we get into the text today. There's some lessons you and I can learn, um, some opportunities that you and I have as Christians living in these last days before Christ comes. That, of course, is the purpose of why we're studying the book of Revelation. We're wanting to prepare ourselves for these last days or the last of the last days, because even in the time the New Testament was written, the phrase last days or I'm coming soon or I'm coming quickly uh, was used a fair bit, including in our text today. So we're looking at the Church of Philadelphia. I'm going to call this the sweet smell of faithfulness. It's great when we're faithful to the things of God and we see or when he sees you and I being faithful to the things of God, to the things of Scripture. This is pleasing to the Lord. All right, let's pray, then we'll dig into our text. Father, we're so thankful for this day. And Lord, just to, to study again another text of Scripture about the church. Lord, we know that uh, most of these messages have had um, a bad report. Jesus has had a bad report. Things that we could learn, though, from their mistakes. But today's is a different learning curve for us. We're going to learn from the, the good things this church has done, the wise things decisions they have made. And Father, we trust that we will follow their example uh, as it plays out in our own lives. So Holy Spirit, teach us some great things today. Encourage us in our faith, Lord, that um, you're at work in our lives and good things are happening when we place our trust in you. So bless us with the message today. Help us to take something home in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're there in Revelation 3, starting verse 7. And we're going to go to verse 13 today. So this is the church at Philadelphia, brotherly love. You know, the church there was, there was two brothers, a uh, uh, younger brother and an older brother, and the one succeeded his brother's king, and they were they had such a love for one another that the coinage that was used at that time in Philadelphia depicted the two brothers in an embrace, and they look almost like twins, except one is older and one, one's younger. And so, uh, so this was kind of the where this name came from, uh, the love of these two brothers. All right, uh, Revelation 3, verse 7 to 13. This is Jesus speaking, of course. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes, comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, the faithful church, some would say this is the church of the open door. That's kind of where we're going to put our focus today. There's a number of things we could bring out of this passage, and I'll, I'll mention a few things here, but I'm going to really emphasize this whole idea of what it's like to have an open door in our faith as Christians living in this world. What does it mean to have a door open to you? Have you ever had opportunities in your life where you thought, well, um, you know, I've done this, that, and the other thing. I've dotted my I's, I've crossed my T's, but I get it. I need a chance. I just need an opportunity. I need an open door. 
You know, sometimes when you're applying for a job position and you think, well, I've done everything, got my resume together, got my references, but I, I just need a chance. I just need an open door. Do you know that God gives you and I opportunities? He gives us open doors to share his love with other people. We don't always take these open doors, by the way. Sometimes it comes by and we miss our chance. And yet there are other times when God does give us an open door and we we seize it, we take uh, charge of it and we think, that would never have happened. I don't even know how that opportunity came up. I want to share you two quick stories. Years ago, shortly after I came to the church, I was uh, there was a lady in our church and she was um, she was an invalid. She, the last few years of her life, she was confined to a bed. And um, she came to the first few services when I was here, but then afterwards she took ill and she was in bed. And, and I went to visit her at different times and she was a real prayer warrior in the church. And one day it was, I was uptown, it was on a Monday, it was my day off, and I felt the Holy Spirit telling me to go and visit this lady. And I thought, oh, it's my day off, I'll go tomorrow. And she died that night. Now, she was a wonderful believer, <clears throat> but I felt like I'd missed an open door of opportunity. I felt like um, if I had just, I wonder maybe God had something for me or something for this woman. I, I feel like I missed an open door. And I recognized that it had been an open door. Here's another story. Many years later, I was... A lady in my church, a couple of the longtime members of our church, the lady was was quite ill and uh, she was at home and and I had been visiting them here and there and and um, uh, I was on my bike one day and and uh, I was I was um, I went past her house. I thought I, I really should pop by and see these people again. You know, she hasn't been doing that well health wise. And I thought, yeah, I really should. I really should see them. And so what what happened was I. Um, I drove past their house on my bicycle and I felt a strong urge from the Holy Spirit to go and, and visit them right then and there. And I, I was on my way somewhere. I can't remember what it was. I thought, oh, you know something? I, I don't want to have to learn this lesson again. I've, I've said no to God's word before. So I went back on my bike, went to the house. Turns out there's a whole bunch of her family there. And they said, oh, did someone from the family call you? I said, no. And they said, how did you know to come? I said, I felt the Lord telling me to come. I said, oh, please hurry. You know, our mom is not doing very well. And she was in the bedroom and, and I spoke with her. She was very weak and uh, her name was Barbara. And I said, listen, let me, let's just pray together. Barbara, I know you love the Lord and, and um, let's just pray together. And we prayed together. And within five minutes, she took her last breath and died. And I, so I came that close to missing it. But that time I did hear God's voice. I took that, his prompting and I acted on it. The other time I didn't. So God gives us open doors. <clears throat> Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to I want to focus on that today. But let's start by by focusing on the the description Jesus gives of himself to this church. He's given him a different description of himself to each of the churches as an appropriate sort of lead in to where he's going with it. Look what he says here. He says this church, these things says he, meaning himself, who is holy, set apart, he who is true, walks in righteousness, walks in truth. See, these are attributes that Jesus saw in this church. They were holy. They had set themselves apart to the things of God. They were surrounded by people who were opposed to this message of, of the Christian faith, and yet they continued to walk that straight line. They were true. They held fast to the word of righteousness. He says that he declares himself to be the one who has the key of David. That's a messianic title, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no, one's open, no one opens. So Jesus is gushing over this church. I told you earlier that the Philadelphia was named such because of these two kings, brothers, one older and one younger, uh, who were so close to one another that they just loved one another and everyone in the city knew it. Um, it was the Philadelphia, these seven churches that we're looking at, it's the youngest of the seven cities. <clears throat> it's um, uh, The area was... Uh, um, well favored for wine production. So Dionysus, the god of wine, was kind of the patron deity over this community. I'm not talking about the church here, I'm talking about the, the city itself, people who live there. Um, and, you know, it was just interesting that it, it, it had been a very um, prosperous city. Um, the, I mentioned this last week when we talked about the church at Sardis, but there was an earthquake in 17 AD that just, it wiped out Sardis. 
Uh, it also basically wiped out Philadelphia and about 10 other cities in that area, smaller cities, but the two main ones were Sardis and Philadelphia. Tiberius, who was the emperor at that time, actually showed some, some mercy and financially supplied those cities with the ability to, to uh, rebuild their cities. So Philadelphia was rebuilt with Tiberius's help from the royal treasury there. Um, but they never really did attain to the uh, the wealth that they had prior to the earthquake. Also, where they were situated was kind of on a plateau area, and it was uh, uh, they had a nickname for it. There's a Greek word for it, but the English translation is the burned land. And it was called that because it was there was a lot of volcanic activity there. So there was quite a few of that volcanoes. So the land was scorched because of that, and there was a lot of earthquake activity, a lot of seismic tremors and this type of thing. So much so that the people of Philadelphia were scared to live at home. You know, so there'd be an earthquake. Of course, the one in 17 AD was very significant, but there were other earthquakes as well. And so people would have this earthquake and then and then they would wait for the aftershocks before they would move back home. But a lot of people, many of the people in this city were too scared to move back home. So they actually lived in tents and huts on the outskirts of the city. Some of them lived in their house during the day and then left at sundown and stayed in the tent outside the city because they were afraid to be in there overnight in case another earthquake happened. So so there was this kind of uneasiness over the city. Um, and yet it was a city that uh, the church that was there was strong uh, despite these physical things that were causing duress on people and the 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 fact that there was a lot of persecution. Let me pick up on that. Um, verse 8 of our text says, I know your works, Jesus said. See, I have set before you an open door that, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You've kept my word have not denied my name. These are people that were standing strong for the faith despite there was persecution going on. A lot of the persecution were Jews who did not like those in the church because they were declaring that Jesus was holy. That was, the, that was a title, you know, holy and true, which is what Jesus says about this church, were terms that were used in the Old Testament to describe only God. And so Jews did not appreciate these Christian people being called this or, or having this title. Um, in fact, Jesus says in verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So these other Jews, a lot of Christians in the, the Philadelphia church were Jewish Christians, meaning they were Jews who had come to understand Jesus as Messiah. And when they did that and gave him the rightful place that scripture gives him, the Jews that were not converted to Christianity really ramped up their persecution. So it was very difficult for them. So they kept doing the good works of God. They were maintaining the righteous stance before him. Um, they, they were unmoved in that. Uh, verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere. So they were persevering amidst affliction and persecution from those around them, uh, amidst the, the, the climate of the city with this fear and anxiety because of the earthquakes. Uh, the volcanic and volcanic action, this type of thing. So there was, they were able to persevere through all these sort of different trials that were coming their way. He says there uh, in verse ten, "I also, because you you have persevered, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world." to test those who dwell on the earth. Now that is an illusion. That verse ten to the chapters you and I are going to study subsequent to the churches of Revelation here, starting at chapter 4, the tribulation period that's coming on the earth. So that's a definite allusion to that. He says, you've, you've persevered, you've kept the faith, you've not thrown in the towel, you've not given in to, what, to the idolatry that some of the other cities have. No, you, you've maintained the, a straight course here. And I'm going to keep you from this hour of testing that the whole world's going to have to go through. That's definitely good news you and I might even say, is this a, re a reference to the rapture of the church where the church is caught away before the great you know, wrath of God is poured out? Well, we're going we're gonna to dive into that in weeks to come here. Um, let's talk a little bit about this open door thing. That's kind of where I want um, us to, to land today. Um, this, why was it called an open door? Well, the, the church itself, Philadelphia as a community, was an open door. 
it was, I'm not talking about the church here specifically, I'm talking about the community itself. Philadelphia was on a plateau that was a crossroads to the rest of Asia Minor. So it was kind of on a plateau there. Uh, and it was a place where it was easy to propagate the Greek culture, the Hellenistic message, the, the culture and language of the Roman Empire. So it was like a conduit to all the rest of Asia Minor. So it was why it was an open door to propagating, evangelizing, I can use that word, the Greek culture and language, the Koine Greek, the common Greek, uh, to be prevalent across the entire Roman Empire, and in particular Asia Minor, that part of it. Turks and Muslims swept across this area um, and tried to persecute it and take it over, but, but they held firm in their faith. Now, it wasn't until the middle of the 14th century uh, before they, it fell to these these other hands that were non-Christian. But but the fact is they were able to persevere. And so from a, a political and cultural uh, standpoint, Philadelphia was an open door to Greek culture for the rest of Asia Minor. And Jesus is saying, just like the city has that reputation, I'm saying to you that you, the church, will be an open door to the propagation of the Christian message across this entire region. So let's discuss that whole open door. He said it was a door that no one could shut. If God opens a door in your life, no one's going to be able to shut it. That's that's the good news. Uh, let's look at this door from two, two angles. Let's look at it as a door, first of all, of salvation. Now that term where Jesus describes himself as the one who has the key of David. He said that in verse 7. He said, uh, these things says he who is holy, who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one's op no one opens. Now, if you're a keen Bible reader, you'll say, I think I've read that before. I think I've heard that before. If you're a keen Bible reader, you'll know it's over there in the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 22. We're going to look at a couple verses there. Um, and certainly, the Apostle John is borrowing the phraseology there, as Jesus says it, from Isaiah 22. And... It's a prophecy there. Um, let's pick it up there in Isaiah 22, verse, let's go verse 20 to 23. Isaiah says this, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. What does that mean? That's, that's a pretty uh, amazing thing, this prophecy. Who is this guy, Eliakim? He was like a servant to the king. Uh, and, and and what's his role here? It says that that... God says, I'm going to put on you the key of David. That's a messianic role. I want to read you something of explanation from this book, Discipleship on the Edge. Um, our author here, Daryl Johnson, said this, um, Eliakim, steward of the riches of King Hilkiah, is given authority to open and shut the door to the house of David. That's the lineage that Jesus came in, right? To what does the house of David refer? In reading the rest of Isaiah, we discover that the house of David is a shorthand way of referring to the kingdom of God, to the city of God, to the temple of God, to all the riches of God and king, or God the king. Jesus Christ is like Eliakim, a steward, the steward of the great king. In fact, he is the great king. And he has the key, the key of David, that unlocks the door to all the riches of the living God. Look, I have put before you an open door. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has opened the door to all that the living God is and has. He says the key of David, of course, it's a messianic title talking about the lineage of Jesus and the life of Jesus. It says that, I like what, what, what Johnson said here, um, by his death and resurrection, Jesus has opened the door to all that the living God is and has. This church, Jesus says, you are opening the door for the people of this whole area of Asia Minor to hear about the riches of Christ. 
Let's look at a, a key verse there. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said something very important uh, for you and I to understand. Because this whole idea of a door leads to a roadway, leads to a path, leads to a route that is to eternal life. And Jesus said there were two choices about that road. Look what he says in, in uh, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Of course, the church of Philadelphia found just how difficult that narrow way is. There was persecution from Jews who didn't appreciate that, that the Jewish Christians amongst them had become followers of Jesus as Messiah. Uh, there was persecution of people in the city who followed Dionysus, the wine god, and worshipped him, uh, worshipped the emperor type of thing, and didn't follow the true and living God. So there was pressure, there was persecution. This is a narrow and difficult path. The late great Anglican churchman John R. W. Stott said this about that passage in Matthew 7. He says, here are two gates and both are open. One door opens onto a broad and crowded thoroughfare. The road slopes gently downward and ends in the destruction called hell. The other door opens onto a sparsely populated narrow path, which winds steeply upward and leads to life in the city of God. I like Stott's description, because these two roads are very, very different. One is very easy no pressure, most people are doing it, but it's the one that leads in the wrong direction. The other one is much more difficult. A lot fewer people are taking this choice. There's going to be a price to pay to be on this road, but boy, it's worth it because the end product is where you want to go with heaven. So a door, an open door, Jesus said this church is an open door. Um, you are going to lead people to salvation. You are going to be a conduit where people can follow and find Jesus as Messiah. Boy, you know, God, God needs you and I in the world to be his ambassadors. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him in this world. And so, you know, certainly we, we don't want the attributes of some of these other churches where they were following idols or they were compromising, you know, they were tolerating sin and thinking it was okay. We want to have like the sterling reputation of this church in Philadelphia that amidst all trials and other persecution, temptation, nevertheless, they were holy and set apart. They stood true for righteousness and, and, and uh, integrity, justice, these things. Uh, and that was them that 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 type of choice of their life their lifestyle and words that go with it i would i might add this was leading people on this narrow path to christ okay so this open door is a door of salvation it's also a door of opportunity uh, let's take a look at a couple verses to talk about that first corinthians 16 the apostle paul really talks about this you know the apostle paul went on three different missionary journeys in the New Testament, he wrote almost two thirds of the New Testament. And, uh, you know, he went where God directed him to go. And one of the things that the Apostle Paul did was he prayed, you know, God, do you want me to go here? Do you want me to go there? And so God led Paul where Paul was to go, but Paul relied on God giving him this direction. And in many cases, it's like, I, God, I need you to make a way for me. I need you to, to open a door for me. You know, sometimes I've prayed for people in, say, in the hospital, and they're they're they've got a dire situation with their health, and they're thinking, "Man, I I need this emergency surgery." But there's the the surgeons that are that would be able to do the surgery. There's very few of them. They're not available. God, I need an open door. I need an open door uh, to get access to this medical help that I need. So I've prayed for different people in that way where I've asked God to open a door of opportunity. Maybe they need a surgery. Lord, would you have a cancellation or something so this person can get their uh, date for the surgery earlier than the date they've been given. So we need an open door so many different times of opportunity. But sometimes the open door of opportunity is for you and I to have a chance to talk to somebody about the Lord. Maybe you've got a family member and they're just, you know, not walking with God. They've got a lot of problems in their life. and You'd love to talk to them about the Lord, but they're not open to it. 
you know, if you ever decide to try to talk about it, they'd be like, uh, no, don't even mention God's name. I've been in situations where people said to me, don't even mention God's name in my presence. I don't want you to pray. I don't want you to mention God's name at all. So then you have to say, then now what do I do? Well, here's what I've done. I just say, Lord, I, I love this person. I know they need the Lord in their life. Oh God, would you just open a door of opportunity? Sometimes it's common ground in another area, you know? I've had conversations, deep spiritual conversations with men in my life who had no interest in God whatsoever prior to me meeting them, but we played on the same soccer team or some other common interest. Let's look, look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7 to 9. He says this, For I do not wish to see you now on the way. He's talking to the Corinthian church. I don't wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul says, I could go here, but you know something? Another door a, 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 that I've been waiting for has opened to me. Well, he means God has opened the door for him. And there's a lot of adversaries, but these people need to hear the gospel. And I need to make hay while the sun shines, as some people say. I need to strike while the iron's hot. A door has opened to me. Let's give me an, uh, let me give you another example. 2 Corinthians 2. Verse 13, 12 and 13. Um, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, he said I had no rest in my spirit. He goes, I would came to Troas and then a, a door opened to me. I, I wasn't expecting it. I was, you know, I don't know where. Sometimes this happens. God interrupts your life, my life. He interrupts the plans that we've made because he's got another door over here and he wants us to go through this at this time. Give you one more verse in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Colossae. He asked for them to pray for him because he's going on these missionary journeys and he's got to minister to different people. And somebody says in uh, Colossians 2, verse, sorry, Colossians 4, verse 2 and 3. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying to, uh, sorry, Praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in chains. He told the church in Colossae, I don't want you to just sort of sit on your hands and do nothing. I, I, I need you to pray for me because there's opportunities out there, but I'm blocked from them and I need access to them. So I'm asking you, would you, would you pray for me? So he says, Praying also for us, that's Paul and his team, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which also I'm in chains. Prayer unlocks a lot of doors. Maybe you're sitting here, we're going to bring this to a conclusion today. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, I need some doors open in my life. I got some people in my family that we need a breakthrough. We need, we need a door opened. Or I would like to people that I work with or, you know, people in my neighborhood to know more about Jesus. And, and they're making choices in their life that are not productive. They're not helpful. God, please help me to, you know, please open a door for me to bring that opportunity to them. This church was faithful and serving God. And God says, I'm going to, I'm going to open doors that nobody can shut. You're going to be able to go to places you never thought possible. There's a, a verse in Proverbs that says, a man's gift makes room for him and ushers him before great men. You know something? God has opportunities where he wants to use you. Yes, little old you, you may think, would God use me? God can use anybody. If we're available and we're willing and we're serving God, God's going to open doors for us. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that our, we live in a world where so many people do need Christ is their Savior. Many are making choices that are not healthy, not productive, and they're far from God. And Lord, we're looking for ways. We're looking for an open door to bring the message of Jesus to people in word and in deed. And I'm praying for everyone in the sound of my voice today, Lord, that they would experience a breakthrough. They would, they would feel like the hand of God is on them to open a door for them to bring the message of Christ to somebody and just give them opportunities that they never even thought were even possible. In some cases, it may be a favor with a medical situation coming up or a financial situation. I pray, God, that you would open doors everywhere 
for us as we serve you valiantly, even as this church did. Encourage us with this message today, Lord. You are the God of the open door, and you called us to be the church of the open door. You want to give us opportunities to walk through. We pray that you'll provide those for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. That was the good news. We're going to end the series, this part of the series in Revelation on a church that, oh, we got to learn from their mistakes. So you join us next week. We'll talk about that. See you then.